All right, Nick, welcome to Born Unstoppable. How are you doing, my friend? Not too bad, Thiago. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen you face to face or almost face to face, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's true. It's been a couple of months. Uh, when was the last time we saw each other? It was before probably at church. Day. Yeah, probably at church, maybe in like uh, February or something. I think we were talking about, you know, how the school year was going and whatnot. But it's been maybe half a year or so. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. And today, well, right now it's October. It's been a while. A lot has changed. We're both in different years. Um, yeah. But I'm excited to kind of hear your experience from the past couple of years in terms of uh, your productivity and how you've adjusted to the new situation and how you continue to adjust uh, to keep yourself at your A game. Mm -hmm. So so let's jump in. Let's start with rapid fire questions. That's how I like to start the the podcast. That way the listeners get to know you really quick, the, the essentials. Um, so that's when you just answer it really quick and then we move on to the next question. If um, something kind of piques our interest, we can circle back around to it. Are you ready? Sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Where did you grow up? Mississauga, Ontario. Okay. Where do you live now? <laughs> right now I'm in Ottawa, Ontario for school, obviously. Yeah. And what's one of your favorite books? I would say it'd be Grey Matter. It's by a guy named David Levi. He's a neurosurgeon. Do you want me to go into details as to why it's my favorite book? Tell us, tell us like one or two reasons why it's good. Yeah, so I mean, just to give you a, a sampler of why it's good is because it's basically this hot, this hotshot neurosurgeon who basically uh, found out that praying with patients uh, can be a transformative experience for their um, for their well being and their health. So I'll leave it at that for now. But oh, super good book for any um, any budding. Uh, pre-med or medical student who kind of wants to give spirituality in medicine a try. That's neat. I, we're, we'll definitely be talking about that spirituality medicine a little bit later. Um, yeah. But that is cool. I'll, I'll have to like at least check out a summary of the book if I don't actually get to read the whole thing. For sure. Um, what's one of your superpowers? Oh, that's a tough one. I would say that my superpower would be my curiosity. I would say that I'm a guy who typically likes to seek out new experiences wherever he can. And I guess just to pull one random one out of my, out of my hat, um, I write letters to prisoners. Um, so that's something that I got involved with a couple, a couple of years ago. And the reason why is because I just wanted to get to know how that specific population, like just what went through their mind, like how they grew up. And if, if I could learn more about humanity through an underserved population and just a population that's been so stigmatized by society. So yeah, I'm just a very curious person in general. So that's just one example. That's really neat. Do they, and I assume they write you back? Yes, they do. <laughs> that's really neat. It's not a one way conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. That's really cool. Um, what do you feel is holding people back from achieving the next level in whatever field that they are in? Ooh, uh, tough, tough. Um, I would say there's definitely an element of pride. So pride can do a lot to our psyche, in my opinion. I think that a lot of people these days, they, they always want to excel at whatever task that they're given right off the bat. And they're not willing to really take a step of humility, uh, sorry, the mindset of humility, and to really get in, get the sense of needing to kind of crawl and then walk and then run. They kind of just want to run right off the bat. So having humility, I think, makes you a more teachable person. And when you're teachable, obviously you're able to get more mentors in your life. And that's really what's going to be able to help you excel to the next level, in my opinion. Man, that is gold for everybody listening. Just so you remember, if you want an equation, humility equals teachable, and that's going to allow you to grow. and uh what you said about people feeling you know pride and wanting to start to like run instead of crawling and then uh the going through the progression i can totally relate relate to that because i feel like in a lot of things in life we get so excited about maybe what other people do or what we want to do we want to achieve more mm -hmm. that that excitement um kind of pushes us to just hit the ground running but it 
we don't approach it with like a a good framework uh framework or a foundation and it often leads to people like stumbling and failing Mm -hmm. um maybe failing a lot more than they would have if they kind of focus on the foundation absolutely yeah and it goes back to i think what almost what elon musk said about thinking back to first principles you always got to start off with the foundation when you're working towards a new problem and when people try to take shortcuts and accelerate towards a goal without having those foundational building blocks in place you essentially are setting yourself up for failure because you you think you know more than you do and your weaknesses become exploited the higher you move up if you don't have a solid foundation at the outset that's good that's good all right so we finished the rapid fire questions Now we can take all the time in the world to answer some of these next questions and just get to know you. Um, But this one, I I didn't prepare this question. This is, I have two more. Sure. Um, And the first one is, what are you grateful for today? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, You know what? I'm actually grateful for a connection with somebody that, recently got reestablished. So uh, there was a recent fallout that I had with somebody in my life for the past couple of years. Uh, We stopped talking. And for about the past month or so, that person actually came to me and apologized because they felt like the connection lost was on kind of on their end. So we've been talking quite regularly for the past, you know, month or so, getting to know each other again and catching up on life and just, you know, having a good time. And I think that's something that I'm grateful for because I just got a message from them not too long ago and uh, just kind of reminded me that, yeah, it's great to have somebody back in your life when you felt like you've lost them, you know? (laughs) Man, that's powerful. Having that reconciliation, something that I I can't say if it's rare, but it is difficult. Um, It's difficult whether you're the offender or you were offended. Uh, whatever the case may be like it just requires swallowing pride and it hurts but like on the other side of that there is joy there's gratitude and there's like a deeper flourishing of that relationship which is really neat absolutely i think human connection is so indispensable nowadays and for something like that to happen is just you know words can't describe the feeling for sure man that's great thanks for sharing that um what are you excited for right now what am I excited for? I uh, kind of spoke to you a bit about this a uh, few minutes ago, but I'm definitely excited to be starting my uh, OBS gun rotation um, mm-hmm. in a couple of days. So it's going to be my second, I guess, clinical exposure after having finished a couple of weeks at the hospital. But now we're starting like our actual core rotation. So jumping into a brand new specialty, um, dealing with, you know, women's health, something that I'm definitely not familiar with and I still struggle with even after having studied all of that in uh, second year. So it's going to be a new environment. It's going to be a new patient population. But I, like I said, I'm a curious guy, love to learn, and I'm ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, that's great. Um, We're actually starting uh, the reproductive system, all that. You're going to cover practically, we're learning theoretically. And yeah, pay attention, man, because it's it's some tough stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah. For those for those people who aren't aware of like med school, Nick is just he's in third year, and for the past two years, it's all most of it's been pretty much theory, like just lectures and learning and just tests. But now he's actually going to get some hands on, primarily hands on experience doing his clerkship rotations, and I think that adds a little. Um, kick in this in their step like for med students that it's like okay now i can finally like do something with what i know (laughs) yeah okay so nick um what let's start with your story Mm -hmm. what brought you to medicine like what got you on the path of your medical journey oh that could be dated back all the way to ninth grade of high school to be honest had a super passionate biology biology teacher, and he just found a way to make science fun and exciting. Like I remember in class, he would kind of like act out how the poly, how are the how the uh, particles and molecules would act when they're in like in a little beaker, 
and he would like throw himself against walls to display like you know kinetic reactions and how the molecules would kind of like you know uh, tackle with one each other to, w w with each other to generate you know more heat and stuff. Just a very enthusiastic uh, person who was just full of life, and he really helped me and a, a bunch of other classmates excel in the sciences. And I think that initial spark kind of oriented my way towards sciences and away from things like math or literature and stuff like that, which, which I also excelled at, but didn't have that same passion for. But for medicine in itself, uh, that would have to be actually after undergrad. So after undergrad, I was able to see, you know, just how powerful science can become once it's used in order to heal people. And I, I, I don't think that there's a greater joy that I've experienced to see people go from such a deep state of suffering to then become almost brand new in the best of cases. And for us humans to be able to harness that power of science for something that's just so good in this way, to me, to me it's, a very, it's a very humanistic, I guess, endeavor. And it's something that I just love. I love the fact that you can also just put, just pour your soul into medicine, um, pour your soul and for the benefit of others. Um, that's, that's really what medicine is to me. It's really sacrificing, you know, all of this time that you have, all of this free time, sometimes your relationships with friends and families to really better the lives of others. And there's, to me, there's no greater joy. I've barely experienced it. I mean, I've just been in the hospital for a couple of weeks and like I've seen frowns become smiles and I, it's inexplicable. It's, it's just an awesome feeling. Man, that's great. Yeah. I was, I was thinking like you're speaking as if you had experience with this, but I know you're like only a, a third year, like beginning of it. And there's so much. Yeah. More. I mean, granted, I have worked in the hospital, so I have shadow physicians uh, for yeah. quite a long time. So I've been able to see from a third person perspective. So I guess to experience it briefly from a first person perspective and to have this kind of reaction, I guess, hopefully sets the stage for, for years and years to come. Yeah, that's great. Did you have uh, any family members in healthcare? Only an uncle and he's a dentist. So on the whole, no, not really. We're, we're mostly, I guess, an IT slash engineering type of family. Okay, so you're the first one to kind of uh, go in this new territory. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. That's really neat. Um, so what do you wish, you know, looking back, uh, I know that you're only in the third year of medical school, but to get to that point, you've had to go through a lot because there's a, just so many things you need to do to get to medical school, uh, yeah. exams, interviews, all that included. What do you wish you had known when you first started for any of those pre-meds listening to this? Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, so I would say that I wish I was more grounded in my values um, because in my opinion, you're going to find that nowadays when it comes to, I guess, that race to getting into medical school. You can follow the typical cookie cutter med school plan of volunteering at hospitals, doing your research and stuff like that. Once you have that plan, it becomes pretty easy and all of that stuff you can learn quite easily on the job. But what you can't learn is your values. That's something that you build with experience, dealing with people. You build it at home. And the importance of values, I think, is that in medicine, if you're not firm on what you believe in, in what you think are intrinsic goods for yourself, it can really derail you and it can lead you down a path of unprofessionalism that you didn't think was possible. A path where you're kind of like cutting corners just to be able to get ahead. A path where you're willing to, to stab each other in the back just to be able to get that spot in medical school. And where does it really end? You know what I mean? If you're willing to stab your colleagues in the back to get into medical school, what's to stop you from doing the same in residency and then to become maybe, I don't know, a, a staff at a hospital, right? So these are all things that you have to correct like now. And 
maybe ad comms can't really screen well for that these days, but I think that they can still sense what it what it's like to be face to face with a genuine candidate. It comes through the way that you articulate your responses. It comes with the way that you speak about your experiences. And so, of course, do the volunteering, do the research, but more, but more importantly, know yourself and, and yeah, just reflect. Reflect on, on who you are, what your mission statement is, why you're trying to get into medicine. And I think you'll be way ahead of the curve if you can do those things. Mm. That's some good advice. Be grounded in your values. Did, yeah. you know, in medical, did you come across any issues like that in undergrad where people, uh, where maybe you ex- you saw or you experienced people um, kind of trying to hurt others so that they can get ahead? Not directly from what I've seen, but I have heard, I guess, horror stories of people who would seemingly be gracious enough to share notes with others and those notes would be tainted with errors for example Mm -hmm. so those are just i guess one of many um instances of uh, of people trying to eliminate competition for for their own selfish reasons yeah what would you say are some you know top three or five whatever values come to mind that people should think about um, before they, well, as they consider going to medical school, but even throughout all of it. And, and like these values can apply outside of life. These values apply to every area of life. But like to you, what do you feel is really important to consider? Yeah. Um, big ones will include honesty, for sure. And the reason why I say honesty is because I've definitely been tempted to, you know, um, falsify um findings for example in a patient uh just to not look stupid in front of a preceptor but then you have a bit of a mental block you're like this doesn't feel right you know better say that you forgot to do so and so exam on a patient versus trying to save face from a preceptor because in the end like i said um these things come back and bite you uh they can harm the patient especially if the preceptor values your word and Things only go downhill once you lose the trust of the medical community. And if you think about it, the patients are the ones putting the trust in you, right? So if you're the one lying, then what, then what kind of, what kind of, like who, who would they be to place their trust and their vulnerability in your hands? If not, even you can uphold these types of values yourself, right? So honesty is definitely a big one. Uh, next one is responsibility, which kind of ties hand in hand with honesty. So just being accountable for tasks that are given to you, um, not trying to not trying to dismiss them, but just being on top of your being on top of task. When when people give you a task, make sure that you follow up. Make sure that you're actually getting stuff done, and that you're staying accountable. So yeah. yeah the- those are two core, I think, core values for no matter what you do. Because if people can't trust you, which relates to honesty, and there isn't much, then they're not going to give you a responsibility. You know, like it won't lead to the other one. Exactly. Um, and uh, it's so easy now and not nowadays, it's so easy in our mindset to want to get ahead even slightly or maybe make ourselves look a little bit better than we are. But like you said, it, it'll come back and bite you in the butt because how you do everything is, or how you do anything is how you do everything. I love that quote because yeah, if you're willing, one. if you're willing to um, lie or not tell the full truth in one aspect of your life, then what's holding you back from doing that in the other areas of your life. Right. And so it, it gives us something to, to think about. Mm-hmm. It's a good challenge for us to, uh, to work through in our hearts. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, if I could think about another one, um, probably altruism. I think altruism is a good one. Mm-hmm. You know, just, just being willing to help others whenever they need help. 
I think for me, for example, I can sometimes be guilty of this. Um, I've had many people approach me sometimes for help and uh, due to um, other responsibilities and commitments, you can't always say yes, unfortunately, yeah. but just being as hospitable as you can, as helping as you can, it, it really goes a long way because when when I really think back about those moments where I've, where I've said no, you it, it's almost like what did you accomplish with that other task rather than helping a, a human being in need? It almost, it almost kind of goes counterintuitive to your to your mission of being in the hospital and helping patients, right? Sometimes you just want to get an extra hour of studying in rather than, you know, help somebody with another, you know, unrelated task. So it's, it's tough. I'm not perfect, but it's something that I truly uh, try to, to value uh, day in and day out, just to be more helpful, be more hospitable, build more connections, because that's what it really is. Medicine is a human endeavor, and it should apply to all aspects of your life, not just patients as well. Wow, that is some truth there, man. Uh, uh, good for you for thinking like deep and being intentional with like thinking about these things. Because it's so easy, like you said, to focus on whatever task you have and kind of push people to the side. But um, after you analyze it and you see like, wait, wait, like I'm here to serve people. Mm -hmm. I'm studying so I can serve people. And here's an opportunity where I can serve somebody. Right, um, exactly. It's so a nail like, on the head. Which, which one am I going to value more? Like a better grade or actually uh, impact in this person's life that could build a relationship? Exactly. That's great. Um, you are somebody who, we, when we talked in the past, you really care about focusing more on the process compared to the end goal. Right. Do you, do you want to unpack why that's important to you? Sure. Um, I think one really easy example that I think even you can relate to, Chiago, is that feeling that we both got, I guess, when we received the acceptance letter to Ottawa Med. And I'm sure that you were ecstatic because I know I was. Mm -hmm. But if you really think back to that feeling, how long did it really last? You know what I mean? Uh, for me, it lasted maybe a whole of 30 seconds to a minute. Oh, Told all my friends and family. Yeah, just that for much. For people who are listening, I'm just like pinching my fingers just like a <laughs> little bit. <laughs> exactly. So I think it's every pre-med pre -med's dream to get into medical school because it kind of, for them, it secures this, I guess, um, this future, you know, they look at it as some sort of end goal for them to finally be happy in life. But then when it comes to it, and now I'm three years in, and now you're two, two years in, you realize that the path doesn't end at medical school. It's an even longer road ahead to become a resident and then to become staff. So the reason why I focus on the process is because going into medicine is a lifelong journey of sacrifice and i've alluded to this earlier on in the podcast it's something that you really have to be comfortable in doing for the rest of your life if you're not comfortable in sacrificing time and energy in pursuit of this career then you're inevitably going to burn out because that's really all you're going to be doing for the next 30 or 50 years however long you're working life is going to last. Mm -hmm. And so and so what I would recommend is it's not that you should feel that you're enduring the process, but rather finding a way to enjoy it. So for me personally, whenever I study, it doesn't feel like this super brutal and painstaking uh, endeavor that I'm going through every single day. I know for for many people it actually is. But for me I, I I don't know. I I don't necessarily find joy in studying, but I don't hate it either. But that accumulation of knowledge is just something that's it's just so empowering. It's empowering and it's it's a process that just keeps keeps your mind working. 
day in and day out. And that's something that I just love. I crave that. Um, I don't think I could ever spend, you know, a day doing absolutely nothing when my brain just shuts off. That's just not who I am. So am I saying that it's only people like me who should pursue medicine? Of course not. But I'm saying that there are things in medicine that are quote unquote, the bread and butter and studying all day is one of them. So you should find a way to make your bread and butter enjoyable. And that's actually good advice that people give when choosing a specialty. Don't choose a specialty for the one or two super cool procedure that you've seen that they may be doing once in a blue moon. It's, do you like the patient who's complaining of back pain who's coming to the ER day in and day out? Is it the patients who, you know, seemingly, um, seemingly have, have an illness, but in reality, they're just there for, I guess, like a, some sort of uh, relief, some psycho, uh, psychological relief, right? So you see a lot of these patients who, who represent the bread and butter of a different specialty. And if you can't deal with that day in and day out, then you should probably rethink your career choice in all honesty. Man, that's some great advice. Again, um, lots of stuff there. The the process is greater than the end. And yeah, I was I was like smiling the whole way through because I could relate so much to that and <laughs> how I was happy I got into medical school. And then the first couple of months of medical school were like so challenging. Yeah, um, it hits you. I I get messages from from first year medical students and from um it's really neat, like because I have this podcast, but I also have a YouTube channel and some people will message me uh, on Instagram be like, hey, watch your video and then they'll share their story. And some of the first years this year know me from the videos. And so they feel a bit more welcome to message me directly and ask questions. And some of the messages I get, I get are exactly what I was going through last year. Like, it's so interesting how you go from undergrad feeling confident, knowing like, oh man, I got into medical school, I'm going to be a doctor. Then you hit that first semester and you're like, I'm so insecure. I don't know how to study. (laughs) I'm drowning in content. And it's like, it's this cycle of new beginnings of like, you're back to crawling. You were running and now you're back to crawling um, and you're going to learn how to walk again because it's a different beast and the bread and butter of of medical school truly is studying and man it's not easy and like i think um i don't really know where i'm at in that sense like some days i'm enjoying it other days i'm just like going through this because i have to i'm like i just got to study so i can do so i can do other things so i can record this podcast with nick or something yeah um but it is way better when you can make it enjoyable like for me Instead of always just doing flashcards, this week what I did is uh, I started drawing out a diagram so I can like visualize what's happening. And then throughout the lectures, I'm adding to the diagram and it makes it better than just like looking at flashcards and like quizzing yourself. Right. Yeah. And some kind of like varying your techniques, right? Yeah. You need variety um, to switch it up. So your brain thinks a little bit different. And the other thing is, I've been listening to podcasts on topics that we've been listening to in class, Mm -hmm. but from like a different perspective. So we'll listen. We just went through like endocrinology, learning about cholesterol. And so I listened to a a podcast, maybe more, you know, how can you change your nutrition to change your cholesterol and stuff? So that way he's like, Oh, Oh, it's like learning with, with class. And it makes it more enjoyable because like, oh, okay, so this patient did this and it changed their life. And then this is what we're learning in class. And so like I'm trying to find this like real world. Okay, this is what's lecture teaching. But what are people doing that are like actually changing their lives so that when I get to that point, I have a like a well-rounded idea of um, what people have tried and haven't. And it makes it enjoyable. Right, right on. Yeah. Kind of like a real world application of what you're learning. Is that what I'm getting? Yeah. 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 Because when you're sitting down in lecture, it's so hard to see the application sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, When I listen to these podcasts, listen to doctors talk about it, 
it gives me that why and it creates focus. Next time I'm, I'm in lecture, I'm like paying attention to detail. I'm like, okay, so I listen to this on the podcast. What are they saying? Like, what's this molecule doing? And it changes, it changes the game for me. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to the area of productivity. Sure. And you mentioned before to me uh, on another day that one of the ways that you create focus is by physical exercise. Yeah. Right. So go ahead and tell us how many kilometers you are. Are you cycling or are you running? Running. Running per, I don't know, just tell us, like per day, per week. Yeah. So ooh, I, I'm kind of a weirdo. So I count my, I guess, my mileage in miles, which is American. But That's if I weird. were to convert it to, I guess, kilometers, for the past, I guess, mm -hmm. few months, I've been putting in 200 or more kilometer weeks. So that equates to roughly, let's say, uh, what do I run in a day? Maybe around like 20-ish miles. So what is that like? 20 times 1.6. What's 20 times 1.6? Like, oh, is that like 36 kilometers or something? 30 kilometers? Let's Somewhere say it is. There. Somebody else can That's... double check that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm not a math major, but uh, <laughs> somewhere around there. So that's about, I guess, three and a half hours of running for me. And I do, I, I split that up. So in the morning, I'll typically do around two and a half hours, like two to two and a half hours, uh, sometimes more. And in the afternoons, I'll put in another maybe 45 minutes to an hour. So before you guys call me crazy, and I'm by no means an elite athlete, although I think it'd be a pretty cool gig if I was, um, the reason why I do it is not only for, I guess, health, which is, I guess, one of the benefits, but more so because of how it makes me feel. So remember how I talked about me just loving the process? Mm -hmm. I, it's hard to explain the feeling that I get when I'm running because you just enter this flow state. This, this, it's almost like this state where you just feel hyper-focused. And once you've been running for, say, past 30 minutes, it just feels like, I feel like my body's just kind of like floating and it's on autopilot. So I run on a treadmill and I'm able to therefore study at the same time because I hook up my laptop to the treadmill. So I do some flashcards while I'm running. But it just seems that time flies by super quickly. And maybe it's like some sort of, you know, circulation thing as well. But I just, my brain feels like it's on steroids because I'm able to pump out flashcards like no other. And when I'm finished that session, I guess the best part is that I feel invigorated. I feel fresh. It's almost like I had never, I had never even started studying yet. But in reality, I just banged out a good two and a half hour session. So the cool thing is, is that I'm able to go immediately into another session of deep learning and to just essentially propel, <laughs> propel my, my productivity even further. So that's, that, I guess that's one of the reasons why I do it. And for me personally, I'm a morning person. So clerkship has been starting pretty early for me around 8 a.m. And I, I'm the type of guy who needs a big meal before I run. So I'll probably be up about four to five hours before, um, before my first clerkship um, event for the day. So that means I'm probably up around like 3 a.m. ish. Um, and then I'll have breakfast. I'll wait maybe an hour or so. So it's now 4 a.m. Go for about a two and a half hour run, two and a half hour run. And then that gives me maybe like an hour to just chill before clear trip starts so that's kind of a typical morning for me i know it's very very unorthodox and i don't recommend it for many i think for the majority of, of people but it's it's working well because of i mean covid so mm -hmm. not really being social in the in the afternoon or in the afternoons or the evenings anyways so figured i'd kind of mm -hmm. go back to uh go back to trying uh a, a new schedule i guess you could say yeah, it is new because your previous one, you're waking, waking up at 2.30 a.m., right? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me see if I can get this straight. You wake up around, you said like 3, 3 a.m., 3.30 a.m. 
Yeah. You eat a, your breakfast. I'm assuming yeah. it's like a, a bunch of carbs. For it's running? a bunch of carbs. If only okay. I could show you how many carbs I have before running. <laughs> okay. But it's a, it's a giant bowl of rice with some chicken, some spinach, and some other some other good stuff. Yeah. All right. So you eat your carbs. Wait an hour, I think. An hour. Yeah. And then you go for your jog for about two and a half hours on the treadmill while That's you right. do flashcards. That's exactly it. And then you just got. Then you still have an hour to just chill before you go to the hospital. Yeah, usually I'm just reading through through some notes or maybe like watching a TV show. It depends how I feel, really. But I once I get that bulk of studying done in the morning, I already feel like I've accomplished so much. So it really, mm -hmm. it really puts me in a good state of mind as well mm -hmm. to be able to start your day off like that, having yeah. accomplished a a major goal. You know. Mm -hmm. When do you go to bed? It'll vary. But on average, lights are off at around 8 p.m. <laughs> That's the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah, 7.30 to 8 p.m. So uh, definitely earlier than most. But what I find cool is that I never really, I'm never really short on daylight because nowadays the sun's, set, it, it, the sun's already down by around 8 p.m. And to be up before the sun even rises, I think it's a very... It's, it's like a psychological thing for me, you know, because I know that most people are still sleeping. So it feels like I'm getting a bit of an edge there, you know, even, you know, psychologically, you know, I obviously go to bed earlier than them when they're probably pumping out a full night of studying. But just the fact that I'm up um, way earlier than everyone else and I'm probably the only one up, it kind of makes you feel like a badass. You know, it makes you feel like you're just that much ahead in a way so all of these little tricks i guess compound into boosting your productivity throughout the day I, yeah i think it's really important for people to find a routine where you get those little tricks where you boost you you boost how you feel mentally because how you think of yourself how you interpret what you do is really going to affect how you function throughout the day and yeah. I wake up at 5 a.m. and Oh, nice. That's earlier than uh, you were previously, right? From what I remember. Yeah, I was doing like 5.30, just like a, I, I hover around 5, 5.30, maybe 6. That's like almost sleeping in. Gotcha. Um, but, I, but I try to wake up early as long as I hit the hours of sleep. I'm aiming to get to get between 7 and 8 hours of sleep. Right. And the first thing I'll do uh, consistently is I'll do my devos through the Bible app and then I'll start uh, I might journal and then mm -hmm. do flashcards right away. Gotcha. Uh, rec recently, I've been starting with a cold shower, uh, which wakes me up really fast <laughs> and then I'm ready for flashcards. Wow. Um, but there is something about it where you're forcing yourself to do something you don't really want to do. Like for me, I don't want to, I don't really enjoy waking up early that much, but right. when I do, I feel ready for the day. And if I, if my sequence of events works where I wake up, take a shower, do the flashcards, do my Bible study, by the time lectures start, I already reviewed cards from the past month, uh, the past week, and like, I'm ready to go. And so- right. The reason why I switched to doing like an early schedule is no matter what happens during the day, I already secured my studying that I needed. Like, like I'm, I'm okay if I experience some type of like uh, interruption throughout the day. Right. Yeah. No, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, and it's the same for me. Once you've accomplished those little things in the morning, I, I can totally identify because it feels like the rest of the day can go completely, you know, off plan. But I still rest secured in a, in in the fact that I've at least that I've at least um, done those I guess those major those those key um, uh, to dos on my list. Yeah, and that's yeah. that that's really good mentally, in my opinion. It's very very good mentally to know that you've at least done something in the day. Yeah, and that's powerful because. Um, there's only two moments in the day that are in your control 
and that's your morning and your night. And yeah. so if you can win the morning, you will most likely win the day. And if you can win the night, it'll set you up for success the next morning. You know, love that. Love that. Yeah. Your 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 morning starts the night before, because if you're up really late, but you got to get up in the morning, you're not going to have a good morning. Agreed, um, yeah. So it's like if you want to succeed, you got to think about the steps that you need to go through to do that. And when we feel like we're in control, even if it's a little bit of control, we feel so much better because I find when when I'm like just reacting to life, when I'm reacting to school, like school is just like shoving information in my face and saying, learn it. I don't feel good. I'm like, I'm drowning. But if I say, OK, I'm going to wake up early. I'm getting I'm going to do what's uncomfortable, which is studying. And I feel in control that changed the playing field for me, because now it's like, oh, I'm in control of my learning. I go to school and it's you approach it with a like a champion mindset instead yeah. of just reacting to everything. Exactly. And I think that's maybe a very key lesson to your viewers who kind of want to optimize their day just in general is to really take take into consideration what both you and I have just discussed is to really find those moments during their day where they feel like they're in that optimal, I guess, flow state, where they're able to have that heightened, that heightened um, level of concentration and to prioritize that time block during their day to make it an, un, a non-negotiable, you know, undisturbed uh, block where they get the most amount of um, high highly cognitive highly cognitively demanding tasks done yeah. as much as possible during that time period because that's going to vary from person to person not everyone's going to be a morning person like us i know some people are totally night owls but that just means that they'll have to prioritize their nights somehow <laughs> yeah yeah um let's let's now move towards study techniques you've mentioned it briefly pretty much so maybe just quickly summarize uh, how you approach studying in third year. I guess every year can switch it up, but like what's your primary way of studying right now? Yeah, um, so I've actually, I actually have switched it up from um, the prior two years. So I'm still using a program called Anki in order to uh, ground concepts and brute facts into my memory. But now instead of focusing solely on Anki, I'm actively looking towards doing a lot more questions. So what I found interesting, and I guess I should have discovered this earlier, is that questions will take the facts that you know and obviously place them in novel contexts in which you've never seen them before. And while Anki does a good, does a good job at making you remember key facts and concepts, you won't necessarily understand how they apply in a live patient situation and multiple patient situations. And problem sets help you essentially accomplish that. You're able to see different presentations of the same disease that you've been studying through Anki. But since there might be some nuances in each question, it might not automatically pop into your head that this is the disease that should be focused on. Yeah. So that's one thing that's been a huge game changer for me. And one thing that Anki lacked severely in, because Anki doesn't really test much of your critical thinking skills, unfortunately, it heightens your memory. And so you have, you absolutely have to complement it with problems as well. And I've been thinking about that recently because I, I want to include more problems in my studying. Um, what's a resource out there that you find has been benef beneficial? So I can't unfortunately speak for the first two years because I do think that the, li that the questions are limited. But for third year, I would say that the UWorld question bank has been indispensable for me personally. Um, I know that a lot of my classmates have been um, preaching Amboss as another as another resource. Mm -hmm. And you have your case files, you have your pretest. But I would say that UWorld is probably the highest yield just because for those who may be wanting to pursue studying for the USMLE, there's going to be a lot of overlap. Right. So, so it's, um, I would say, my top resource at the moment. And just to touch on study techniques before we, I guess, move on to something else. So I would say that if you can structure your day 
into a reviewing period and then a learning period hmm. and figuring out when your the when when your concentration is the best and putting your learning period during that time slot i think that's going to be the best way for you to utilize your your lim limited cognitive energy and that's exactly what i do so i'm when, when i'm running on the treadmill i'm not trying to like learn new information because it's going to be really hard to kind of learn while running so the less cognitively demanding task is to review while i run that way when i'm done all of that stuff and i'm sitting down at the desk like a normal person would, <laughs> I can actually learn new information and focus really hard on uh, untangling those difficult concepts by watching videos, by Googling stuff. So you have to be very, you have to really unpack um, the different aspects of your studying. Don't be doing like problem sets while you're exercising because that's very cognitively demanding. Yeah. So do things throughout the day that are, you know, that are less cognitively demanding so if you're doing flashcards when you're at the grocery store that's perfectly fine doing it while walking to class that's okay you're not supposed to be learning stuff during those time periods really try to be um intentional on where you put your learning blocks and your reviewing blocks and that applies mm -hmm. to anyone at all levels pre-med med whatever yeah that's golden um just to summarize do a reviewing period when you maybe don't need as much energy to focus exactly. and concentrate and then do a learning period where your concentration is best. That's right. And uh, you, you said you study by kind of using videos and just Googling and kind of making those connections and probably quizzing yourself along the way. Yes, absolutely. I think that passive learning is the worst way to learn. I'm sure a lot of your viewers probably already know what passive learning is, but if you, if you guys don't know, it's basically when you're kind of just rereading a text over and over again, you're not engaging in the material. You think that you know what you're learning, but in reality, if you were to just close that book and was asked to summarize what you've just read, you probably have no idea what you just read. So to really question things at all, at every single sentence, if there's some, if there's a word that you don't understand, just take that extra two seconds and Google it. It makes a world of a difference in your retention and in the way that your mind forms connections within your material. Okay. So let's transition to a different topic completely, sure. which is spirituality and medicine. Now, idea. we met because you were the leader, uh, one of the leaders, the execs for CMDA Ottawa, and you have passed on that torch to myself and Isaac. You know, it was Boaz and Nick, and now it's Isaac and Tiago. And mm -hmm. so I know that you are passionate about your faith. You're passionate about serving people through medicine. Yeah. And how do you balance both? Like, how do you view both working together for the benefit of your patients and yourself, your own spiritual health. Right. So definitely a loaded question. Um, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I think, I think if I remember the statistic correctly, there's about like 75 or 76% of Canadians who have some sort of spiritual identity, whether that be religious or non-religious, they just feel connected to some sort of higher power. Mm. So I think that for the majority of Canadians, we all feel this sense of spirituality as being part of our identity so where that comes into play in medicine is that you have this you have this very important tool at your disposal when it comes to therapy and it's often overlooked because it's not directly science-based yeah. but spiritual healing has a huge impact on the patient's well-being and i'll give you one example of, of this so when i was in uh, second year, I had this, uh, this elective in a rural community. I won't name it just for, because it's a super, super small town, but it's super up north uh, in Ontario. And I was in this small town. One of the things that struck me the most about that town was that it had a huge, huge church. So immediately I knew that the community was likely to be religious. And 
I, I met one patient who at first she seemed quite hostile to have vet me. I don't know if it's because I didn't fit the, the mold of the uh, typical resident in that area, but yeah. uh, it was, it was kind of hard to, you know, just build a rapport at the outset. But what was interesting is that over the course of getting to know this patient, getting to know her story and her, her history, something within me just had to bring up the fact that I loved the local church. And I, so I brought that up just in conversation casually and almost immediately, you know, her eyes kind of just like lit up and she was like, Oh, are you like, do you happen to be Christian? And I was like, well, yes, I am. And so that just sparked a, another maybe 10 or 20 minute conversation with not only her, but her daughter, who was also a practicing, practicing Christian at the time. And what was really powerful about that encounter, and this is quite controversial, but uh, I would just want to let the viewers know that I was very diligent and smart about this, uh, about this encounter. Um, but the environment led itself to me being able to offer to pray for her, to pray for her health, to pray for her hospital admission, to pray for her overall well-being. And as soon as the prayer concluded, um, you know, and we kind of just locked eyes once again, she, like, it was hard, it, it was hard for me to really miss the amount of gratitude that her and her daughter felt. They've never been prayed for by a physician. I mean, yeah. let alone any healthcare provider, but a phys I guess a quote-unquote physician, because I'm a, I'm a medical student, but somebody who could be their healthcare provider, right? And it it made the rounds in the community as well. I mean, very small town, people talk. So the next day I, I was in clinic and a totally random person who I was seeing quickly mentioned the fact that, hey, like, aren't you the guy who prayed with so-and-so? And I was That's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and that person was like, I just want to let you know, Nick, that that, like what you did for that family was just beyond undescribable. Like they've just felt so, so relieved, so unburdened of the uh, chronic health issues that they've had to deal with for, for years on end. And so even if I hadn't done anything medicinally, just the fact that I was able to connect with them on that spiritual level, on that, that psychological level, mm -hmm. it just offered this other dimension of healing. And I think that's very powerful. It's something that's untapped by a lot of healthcare professionals, in my opinion. And, you know, obviously, because of the fact that religion is, is such a sensitive topic, I'm not saying that we should all be praying with every single patient that we meet, because that's something that's very irresponsible. And it's something that can lead to a lot of um, ethical issues. But if the opportunity presents itself, if you see the conversation leading in that way, and you know that the patient is very open about their faith, then why not, you know, take the initiative and yeah. not only display your boldness in Christ, but show that you're not afraid to call upon, I guess, his name in order to help them uh, in that time of desperate need, because every little bit counts, you know what I mean? And there's nothing that makes me happier than to call upon the great physician to, uh, to help them in their time of need. So, yeah. Wow, man, that's a great story of faith and reaching out. You know, when you're sharing that, I was thinking about what it's interesting how sometimes what the world or what others think is like a weakness can be one of the greatest strengths, one of the greatest tools to connect with another human being. And just like you said, if the patient, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a medical uh, scenario. If you're out in the world and you see that somebody believes in God, they're spiritual, you get to know them a little bit and you see that they would be okay with you praying uh, mm -hmm. with them and for them, then that's an instant connection to their heart. And exactly. it just it it like people have a, a shield, a face. And when you pray, that's like an arrow straight through that straight to the heart and it shatters all barriers. And then they go, whoa, this is somebody I can trust because exactly. in a in a spiritual 
belief level, you know what each other believe. Like there's no guessing, um, hopefully. And when when you're at that point, it's there is a connection. And for you as an outsider to come and pray, and it truly must have like shifted her perspective of what's possible out there in the world, shifted her perspective towards people, any other doubts that she had. And it didn't just impact her. That story went around the community, impacted other people, probably increased hope. And so it's neat to see that the step of of calculated boldness um, (laughs) was really impactful in a positive way. And I totally agree with you. Like, as much as I would love to pray with every patient, it's not the wisest idea because a lot of patients just or a lot of people don't are, are just aren't open to that. And so yeah. it would cause uh, them to close up rather than open up. And it would just uh, one, it's unethical in the medical scenario. And two, you're not always uh, putting the other person first. And no matter what our beliefs are, like Jesus he never forced himself into a relationship. He said, follow me. And then the person had a choice. Um, mm-hmm. He would. He was never forceful about anything. And so if the opportunity arises and it's okay to like pray for somebody, go for it. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And just a quick note, Thiago, and this is why I would highly recommend that you especially read the, the book Gray Matter because he was the one who inspired me to even start this in the first place. But as you may know, being a neurosurgeon, you have very high expectations from society. Somebody who is very well calculated, somebody who's highly intelligent, somebody who seemingly can replace God. And so to see a neurosurgeon humble himself and to realize that through all of his reflections in the operating room that he in fact didn't have complete control of the final outcome and that there was something greater beyond him who would dictate the final prognosis of the patient. Once he really came to terms with that and realized and realized that he himself was not God, I think that's when he was able to finally humble himself because, you know, prayer is something that can also communicate weakness. Um, I mean, from, from the perspective of the person who's praying that maybe a lot of people feel that, you know, it's like, well, if I'm praying, does that kind of mean that I don't know what I'm doing because I'm kind of hoping that, things will get better because I'm not in total control of the situation. I mean, this is probably not a topic, but I mean, I don't personally think that we are in total control of anything, (laughs) but um, I I think that you have to be somebody who is um, just not afraid to put your pride to the side for this one. It's uh, it's difficult. And I don't know if there, if it's the, the common thing for Christians to, to be praying for each other. Uh, sorry, Christian physicians to be praying for their patients. Yeah. Let's hope the Christians are praying for each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's let's do another transition again. So that was really great, I think, um, okay, overview of kind of what spirituality and medicine can look like. Yeah. And it can go so much deeper than that. But uh, let's focus on maybe a moment in your life where you failed at something, right? Because oftentimes when we're listening to these podcasts, listening to stories, we can get this idea of like, man, this guy's got everything together. He's waking up at 3.30 a.m. <laughs> jogging. He's he's killing it. Does he ever mess up? Um, so uh, if you have a story, could you share with us a, a moment where you you failed at something? but then also share what's a good way to overcome failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, Getting really deep right now, Chiago, but um, yeah, I mean, it's what we're about. Yeah. It's what we're about. Exactly. Born unstoppable. So about a few years ago, um, I I was training for my very first marathon and I wanted to go big for this marathon. Uh, Cause whenever I do something, I try to put my heart and soul into it. So very first marathon, I think it was my first year of running as a whole. And so I was very naive in both training techniques and in the way that I approached my nutrition for this event. And not only did I want to train for the marathon, but I figured that I would also do it for a good cause. So 
back then and still now, I'm a pretty big advocate for organ organ donation. Mm -hmm. So I do think that you know uh, people should be registered uh, organ donors. So if you guys aren't, uh, be a donor.ca, please, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, register to be a, an organ donor. Just my little plug. But uh, essentially, I I put out this I guess campaign on Facebook where I said that you know for every person who uh, registers to be an organ donor. If I don't meet my goal marathon time, I will donate ten dollars for each new registrant that uh, registers through my platform. So I didn't get many registrants because my Facebook is pretty pretty small. I think I got maybe like thirteen or fourteen people. But anyways, my goal was my goal, and I trained diligently for about three to four months. And knowing the person that I am, I'm somebody who tries to do a little bit too much sometimes and so during that training block i was running you know several hours a week uh not as much as i am now but i was running maybe like 10 to 12 hours a week just starting out you know things were going super super well for the first two and a half months ish come month three i start feeling this this overwhelming sense of fatigue overcome me something that i have that i've never really felt before wasn't really shortness of breath. Um, I am an asthmatic, but it definitely wasn't that either. Uh, looked online, couldn't really figure out what it was. Again, you know, some shortness of breath, aching in the limbs, just didn't feel uh, well overall. And now during that time period, I was in what's called the taper phase. So that's generally a time period where you're trying to back up a bit on training in order to let your body recover, in order to, per per to perform at its peak. Uh, on the marathon day itself. And so people were saying, yeah, you're probably just feeling sluggish because you're not running as much as you're used to, but don't worry, you'll be fine. So listen to their advice, towed the starting line. And throughout those three months that I've been practicing, I knew for sure, like for sure, that I was going to hit that goal time. But the inevitable happened and I almost overshot my time by like by like double like I, I think i was aiming for like three and a half hours i came in at around like five hours and like 15 minutes Whoa. so it was a very humbling experience and i later found out that i developed iron deficiency anemia uh throughout that process so what running does is that it can cause what's called foot strike hemolysis so for, for those who are in medicine, basically for people who are not eating enough iron or meat and they run a lot on hard ground, the impact force of your foot on the asphalt can actually crush red blood cells. And if you're not well attuned to the symptoms earlier on, it can eventually progress into full-blown anemia. So I had that basically. And so that, that was a big hit to my ego um i felt very embarrassed um but i was also a man of my word so i still posted on facebook was fully transparent about my time um and i made the donation because i'd failed my my goal but what that whole process taught me is that throughout the entire training period i felt like since i put in the work i deserved to reach my goal. And I think that this is something that everyone can relate to. You know, we all feel like if we work hard enough for something, we deserve to get that prize at the end. Mm -hmm. But then real life hits and it made me really reflect on what that truly meant. It's like you can prepare your whole life for something and just in a moment, all of that can get taken away from you. And so it was humbling for me, that whole experience, because I actually saw myself embarrassed to be near the end of the pack who was running. I saw a lot of people who didn't look quite in shape like I was, but I was kind of like running at the same speed as them. So that, all, that, that was just really disruptive to my psyche because I was like, man, I must have trained so much harder. Like, why am I running at the same pace as them? But I think the cool thing is that with the marathon, you know, even though we don't all finish at the spot that we want to, that, that we envision ourselves finishing at, the important thing is that we finish in the end, regardless of pace. 
And so I guess my advice for overcoming failure is once again, ditch the pride, man. For me, that was a big, big, big lesson in humility to, to think that my ego was inflated to the point where I thought that I deserved better, um, I think was a, a huge disruptor for me. Yeah. Wow. Ditch the pride. Um, I did not know that you could do that just by running. And I can't imagine that how you must have felt. Like you said, you, you, you ran for so long, you train for so long, you get to the, the competition day and you're not at your best performance. Yeah. You're not optimal. Um, that reminds me of, you know, a couple podcasts ago. I think the one I did before this one, it's not out yet, but I talked with, with Ryan, Ryan Allen Bell about the importance of uh, ownership, right? And not blaming circumstances or other people for the results that, that you see. And mm. what you did to overcome your failure is you, you, you took responsibility. You said, listen, like, you know, I'm going to own up as my fault. Something happened. You maybe didn't understand it at that time, but you, you paid uh, what you were supposed to pay. Yeah. You learned from that experience, but then you changed how you're going to act. Um, mm -hmm. You took that ownership and you said, you know, probably you thought of this, like I'm in control of this. What can I do to change so I can get a better result next time? You didn't just uh, complain like, oh, I'm not a good athlete. I'm not going to run a marathon again. I clearly yeah. can't do it. Right. No, you mm -hmm. said you know, there's hope. I, I can do it. Something happened. I got to adjust. I got to tweak something. And now you're back at it. You're running more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's almost like you got to set expectations for yourself that obviously, you know, you, I, I want your viewers to obviously shoot for the stars. And I think that's something that we, sh we should all be doing. But to think that we deserve the stars, I think is a whole different, uh, it's a whole different thing, you know? <laughs> Shoot for the stars, but you don't deserve them. <laughs> exactly. That's a good because, one. I've heard that. Because is it truly the case that hard work is directly proportional to your to your success in this life? Like, are you willing to tell me that throughout my life I've worked quote unquote harder than certain people in developing countries who labor day in and day out for their daily bread? I don't. I don't know. I mean, we definitely work hard differently but it's just it's just this unfairness in society that i think that is uh systemic and um that's why i think that hard work is important but it certainly doesn't make you entitled to anything yeah yeah it's always important to uh do your best to not feel entitled cuz we just aren't <laughs> we should exactly. no matter where you are in life it's uh as hard as it can be I think there's always one thing to be grateful and as if we can latch on to that and we can be excited about it and we can just kind of chase that, then it'll lead on to the next endeavor and, and they keep going, but it doesn't help anybody to, to feel entitled and like you can't, you can't achieve something. Then you, then you're limiting yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. Do you have a favorite quote? I love quotes. Favorite quote? Um, it would have to be from the Bible, man. <laughs> I mean, I can read you my favorite Bible verse. It's also my favorite quote, uh, I guess, for many reasons. But it's a classic, right. man. It's uh, 1 Corinthians uh, verse 13. It's uh, It goes, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. So, I mean, it's, a, it's my favorite quote for a couple of reasons. I think one of the most obvious reasons is that it gives a definition of what love is. But more mm -hmm. importantly, it's something that I always strive to to um, to 
to get to, you know, all of those characteristics. It's, I'm certainly not perfect, but I, I do think that if I could embody one or more of those characteristics on a daily basis, I'd be such a, I guess, in my opinion, a better person, a, a more caring, loving human that just radiates positivity uh, to the world around me. And what more could I ask for than to be that person for other people? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it goes, it also goes to those who sometimes are not as friendly to, towards you, right? So that definition just says, hey, man, like, it's okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't mind the haters. Um, keep being true to yourself. Uh, keep exuding that positive energy. And so, yeah, it, it's really just like a small recipe for a good and happy life, which is why I love that quote so much. Love it. I love your, your explanation. I agree with you. I can't really add too much. And I think that if we just even read that verse every day or three times a week and just meditated on it, just thinking about those things uh, will set the intention of your heart to sure. see and see that and act those things out uh throughout the day very powerful yeah so what do you so this so the title of the podcast the name of it is born unstoppable <laughs> and i want to hear from you who you are unstoppable what are three traits uh, that really that you think make somebody um unstoppable and limitless hmm. all right um Trait number one, I'm going to say it again, be humble. Trait number two, be unique. And trait number three, uh, do you want me to explain all of these? Maybe I should just name, name yeah, them for give, now. Yeah, give, name the three, and then if you want to ex give a little explanation of each one. Yeah, okay, so be humble, be unique, and... third one be grounded in your values i would say so being humble i think was a big theme of this of this podcast and it's something that i truly 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 believe in you know don't think yourself as being above anyone in society be it you know uh, any any sort of like a person you see on the streets or workers who you may think are of a different class instead talk to them get to know them just like how i um write to prisoners i mean i also worked with homeless people learned a whole bunch about them you know they are human beings they are worthy of your time and energy uh no work is beneath you you can learn a ton any skill is valuable so that's my number one tip and it, it'll take you it'll take you just miles and miles in my opinion because the more you can learn about different people in life the more you'll be i guess in my case being a, being a future physician the more you'll be able to be relatable the more you'll be able to relate to those people you'll be able to understand their struggles what they're going through you know so don't think yourself as being above anyone ever uh number two what did i say for number two again was it uh be unique unique yes yes so i think that um a lot of the your listeners will probably not have heard stories that are similar to mine and hopefully that hopefully you'll be having a lot of unique people as well other people who will have their own unique stories but really you should just be comfortable with who you are yes there are ways to get to where you want to be in life through conventional uh, models or paths but cr really create your own journey man like you are a different human that has their own set of experiences their own upbringing why would you want to be like somebody else like there are several med students here that have their own compelling stories their own amazing adventures don't copy them like find out what really drives you and screw the haters just keep doing it if it feels right if it truly feels like what you're doing is good then your passion is going to be mountains and mountains greater than all of those hateful comments that might be saying that you can't do it so that's number two uh number three is grounding yourself in your values so something i mentioned earlier earlier on in the podcast 
grounding yourself in your values because like I said, they don't teach that in textbooks. They don't teach you how to be caring towards individuals necessarily. They don't teach you, uh, you know, humility, respect, altruism. Sure, you can understand the definition, but when it comes to the actual practice of it, it starts at home, man. It starts with how you treat your family. It starts with how you treat your close friends, etc. So get in the habit of forming those good values. I'm not perfect at it. I'm definitely working on it. But if you set yourself goals for those uh, for values and in really sharpening and fine tuning those personality characteristics, you're going to be somebody that people will willingly give their lives to in order to help them out. And that's if you're trying to pursue medicine, that's what you're trying to get to. You know, you want to be that dependable that dependable authority that people can, you know, trust with their entire life in their moments of, uh, of desperation. So yeah, those are my three. That's neat. Humble, unique, and grounded in your values. Uh, one, one quick word, um, about that last one. I remember I was having a, a discussion with somebody on Instagram who's in the area of healthcare. I can't remember. I don't really know this person. Um, okay. but you're saying be congruent with with your with your values with your beliefs right don't do things yeah. that are different because it's going to throw you off you're going to you're not going to be yourself so you got to know what your values are and then stick with them if somebody wants you to deviate from them then just be like sorry i can't that yeah. goes against my morals like it literally violates who i am and i can't do that because if you start going down the wrong path it's going to play with your psychology and your spirit really so that's yeah. powerful. Those three things um, are really good. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no worries, man. Always a pleasure. Is there anything else that you want to mention uh, before we wrap this up? Um, I don't know, man. I think I've already said a bit too much. <laughs> it was a great no discussion. Worries. We talked about a lot, and I know there's a, a ton of things, a, a lot of value for people, students and non-students, that they can listen to this and, and take notes, and hopefully uh, people appreciate your story and the conversation that we've had today. Absolutely, and thanks again for having me, Chiago. It was great catching up with you and just to get you know, some of your thoughts as well, because you know, ever since you've launched this podcast, it's been such a wild ride, I'm sure, and like you've already added so much value to uh, the medical community and you're and you're such a you're such a man of bold faith as well so kudos to you really for doing what you do um i appreciate it we, thank we you need more uh, we need more students like you who uh who are not afraid to i guess just be themselves mm -hmm. um thank you thank you so much for that if if people want to know more about you maybe connect with you is there anywhere they can they can uh, find you sure i mean they can uh, contact me through email it's going to be nicholas kvng at gmail.com um, i guess alternatively they could try to find me on facebook if they uh kind of snoop around and find you first and then they can look at the <laughs> mutual friends and then look at you know nick ng yeah creep, so creep can, my facebook <laughs> yeah creep creep Chicago's facebook and, and follow him follow him on uh uh youtube and uh, his podcast five out of five on the podcast <laughs> all right so you, you don't have instagram but that's okay. Um, if people want to connect with you, like you don't have Instagram, right? I do, but it's it's a dead account, so I don't check it too often. You don't often. use it. Yeah, yeah, it's not worth it. Okay, so <laughs> if you guys want to connect with Nick, uh, listen back to his email and, and email him, or connect with me, and I'll and I'll forward you to him. And uh, that wraps up our our this podcast episode. And so I would really appreciate it if you guys made it this far. One. You're a champ because this is going on for about an hour and 19 minutes. So many things we're Whoa. talking about. Yeah, an hour and 19 minutes. And so what I want you to do is if you gained any value, please take a picture of, of your podcast app. Or if you're watching this, take a picture of the screen and share it on Instagram and tag me at Chiago Luz Vargi. And if you do, I'll show Nick, I'll take a picture and I'll send it to him on Facebook since he doesn't have Instagram. <laughs> um, yeah, share that just so this podcast can grow, more people can discover it so that they can learn to develop an unstoppable mindset and influence the lives of those around them in a good way. Nick, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I hope you, Nick, have a great day and all the listeners have an amazing day and I'll see you guys 